can all agree that the work of Mass LPP is quite inspiring. Uh, as Terry mentioned, uh, they're not alone. There's been a lot of similar work going on a lot around the world. Terry mentioned some of it, so I'm going to move through this a little bit quick. Um, but Australia has been a real hotbed of civic lottery use, uh, thanks in large part to the New Democracy Foundation. So their uh, randomly selected citizens' juries have done things like shape the $4 billion budget of the city of Melbourne, uh, decide whether or not the state of South Australia should house the world's nuclear waste. As Terry mentioned, the recent referendums in uh, Ireland, uh, things are catching on in Europe. The, the abortion referendum was first deliberated and proposed by randomly selected people from all parts of Irish society. Uh, other parts of Europe, Belgium, the Netherlands, you have G1000 events that are influencing municipal policy. And the city of Madrid, Spain, is working to replace all the elected officials on its oversight council with randomly selected people because of continued frustration with the conflicts of interest there. Elsewhere, we've seen in Tunisia, Citizens uh, Assembly on Healthcare Reform, and uh, we've seen randomly selected farmers' juries in Latin America and India uh, discuss air cultural policy. In Ghana, Uganda, Bulgaria, and China, uh, deliberative polls bring randomly selected citizens together to discuss issues like urbanization and public works projects. And as Terry mentioned, there's some stuff going on in Mongolia where now uh, civic lotteries are a key part of their constitutional amendment process. Here in the States, the Jefferson Center has done citizens' juries on different policy issues and even to evaluate congressional and presidential candidates leading up to an election. Um, and we're also happy to have been here from Healthy Democracy. They've been doing great work in Oregon and also in Arizona. They've had Citizens Initiative Review. And so randomly selected citizens come together to evaluate ballot measures. And then they make recommendations that go on to the voter's guide come election day. And this process is actually being piloted right here in Massachusetts uh, for the second time now. And uh, so look for that in the upcoming election. And there are many, many more examples that, as Terry said, uh, show that uh, people who are brought together, random samples, can make sound policy decisions. Obviously, it has also been, been proven by the work of Mass LVP. Now I'd like to shift gears a little bit and get us thinking about other democratic contexts beyond this well-established and increasingly popular use of lotteries to um, form citizens' panels, citizens' juries to influence policy. Where else could, could and should we be trying out lotteries? Our organization, Democracy in Practice, has been working in schools to use lotteries to form student governments, also called student councils. You can find one in just about every school in the world, and they tend to be small, simple, and often do not do or affect a whole lot, so it's a nice low-stakes environment to get started and to tinker around. And student governments are almost always elected. And elections clearly aren't working in this context. They are often glorified popularity contests that put this important civic engagement and civic educational experience out of reach for all but the most confident, charismatic, and high-achieving students. This has the effect of increasing apathy, you know, generating apathy. And it also incorrectly teaches young people that their role in a democracy is to vote for some smiling candidate and then to tune out to the next year. So, we took schools as a good place to start, and so far our work's been in Bolivia, but student government there is pretty much the same as it was in my high school in New York uh, and in schools around the world. Five years and five schools into this experimentation, uh, we have made mistakes, we've learned uh, a lot of lessons, we've seen some real successes. And I'd like to share with you seven of the important lessons that we've learned with hopes that it might inspire you to think about how lotteries could improve democratic practice in the organizations and institutions that you're a part of. So the first lesson that we've learned is that lotteries increase participation. In one of the schools, they used to have just a handful of students run as candidates in elections each year. And then they switched to lotteries and 230 students volunteered to enter student government, to try to enter student government, which was half the school. In a rural school, we've seen literally every student enter every lottery that they could. Now, the jump in participation hasn't been this dramatic every time in every school. Um, and certainly, some of it is due to our presence and our efforts to make student government appealing. But make no mistake that the change from elections to lotteries has been key. And it's not difficult to understand why. So, most teenagers are already dealing with their fair shares of fears and insecurities. And then a teacher comes along 
with this great option. They say, who wants to run as a candidate in a school-wide election? And most students are thinking, seriously? Do you want me to voluntarily subject myself to two of the most terrifying experiences? Public speaking followed by public rejection. It's, it's not an invitation that's going to be appealing to, to many students, uh, mostly to the students who are already self-assured. And so most of the other students, they turn away and they're turned off from student government. Another thing that we've seen is that in addition to increasing participation, lotteries are more fun than elections. And this, this is something that we hear from the students, that we hear from the teachers, and that we see that ourselves. There's a countless ways to do a lottery. Um, Mass LBP does it uh, in, in more of a tech-related tech way than what we use. We try to keep it very simple, make it public, and provide each participant their own moment of excitement. And so in the schools that we worked in, it usually involves reaching into some kind of pot or box and pulling out a dried fava bean. If the bean is green, it's not your lucky day. But if it's purple, you're in. It's a beautiful thing to behold. I'd like to give you just a sense. This is how it tends to look. The first lotteries are often administered by teachers, and then subsequent lotteries. We do several a year to get more students involved. Subsequent lotteries are administered by outgoing student members, student government members. This young woman took so long to pick a bean that the lights went out <laughs> before she... She ended up getting picked at a subsequent lottery. This girl was quite shy and just about fainted when she got picked, but uh, she did a good job later on. So in addition to being more fun, we've seen that uh, you know, another lesson that we've learned, or rather confirmed, is that lotteries increase diversity and representatives. We've heard a lot about this. It's not surprising. Uh, now students enter student government from all different social circles. They bring various, uh, various skills and interests, and they have different grade point averages. And we also stratify these lotteries so that there's an even bender, uh, balance and age, uh, sorry, even gender and age balance. And I was recently um, talking with the president of a university in Ohio who told me that some colleges here in the United States are thinking about getting rid of their student government because of continued frustration that it doesn't reflect the diversity of the student population. And uh, I don't think that the solution to this problem is to get rid of student government, but rather to get rid of elections. And if you want a student government that is demographically representative, lotteries and stratified sampling, that's what they're designed to do and they do it well. A, note, uh, a side note here is that with the increased diversity, we've seen more diverse friendships, which has been really refreshing. So students are randomly selected, who might not otherwise associate with one another. And through working together, they find that they have more in common than they thought, and that their differences actually make things more interesting. These students here are getting their first look at pictures that we gave them when they finished their term of office together. It's a picture of them working together. The fourth lesson that we've learned is that lotteries should be combined with capacity building if those selected are going to be effective. And so most students don't come in with deliberative democratic skills, not even those high achieving students that could win an election. The good news is, is that they can be taught. It's not rocket science. We provide training and students rotate responsibilities so that every member of the student government ends up having to learn to take minutes, set agendas, facilitate meetings, and to speak in front of the entire school on behalf of their team. We also teach critical thinking, deliberation, and, and help them uh, learn to arrive at decisions together. So the learning can be quite transformative, there can be quite a bit of growth, and we've had many teachers observe that this carries over to the classroom. The fifth lesson that we've learned is that when provided proper training and support, randomly selected students can do amazing things. So we've seen a student government establish the first library that their school ever had. We've seen another one run reforestation and recycling campaigns. We've seen them organize school-wide field trips, meet with their mayor or city councilor to demand improvements in their schools. We've seen fun stuff too, like school-wide bicycle uh, races. The sixth lesson that we've seen is that lotteries challenge our assumptions about leadership. We're finding that we don't know a whole lot about democratic leadership. It seems like every time we have a lottery, my teammate Raul and I, we come out of that first orientation meeting 
and we have the same type of conversation. One of us will say something like, boy, that Miguel, he's going to be an important member of this student government. Yeah, but did you see Maria all quiet there in the corner? Got our work cut out with her. And yet, time and again, we're dead wrong. Miguel is confident, he presents himself well, but he ends up quitting or getting voted out of the student government because he skips meetings. When he shows up, he's late or he tries to dominate the conversation. And he doesn't follow through with the things he says he's going to do. Maria, on the other hand, takes a little while to warm up to the group, but then she becomes the person that everyone looks to. She's there. She's on time. She gives her opinion, but she values the opinions of others. And when she says she's going to do something, everyone knows it'll get done. Miguel's the type of student who could win a school-wide election. Maria wouldn't be a candidate if her life depended on Now, this is not to say that every charismatic student is a terrible teammate or that every shy student becomes a star. But the fact that our assumptions of these students' leadership potential are so regularly proven wrong suggests that when students are asked to pick their leaders in an election, their assumptions are probably wrong, too. And it's not just shyness and charisma that fool us. Most teachers tend to assume that the students with the best grades will be the best leaders. They're responsible, they're high achieving, and yes, they tend to do well in student government. But thanks to lotteries, we've seen just as many irresponsible, struggling students do well in student government, too. So lotteries challenge our assumptions about leadership. The seventh and final lesson that I'd like to share with you is that lotteries can be a gateway to continued engagement for people who would otherwise not become civically involved. Once these students get a taste of student government, they tend to want more. Here we have one group that's finishing their term of office. And this is not limited just to our projects. John Gastel and his colleagues have found that when people are randomly selected to serve on juries in the courts, they're more likely afterwards to vote, to volunteer, and to talk about politics at the dinner table. So these are some of the lessons that we've learned in our particular context, in educational context. Lotteries really are better than elections. Students and teachers agree. So we've conducted uh, research with support of the New Democracy Foundation, interviewing over 60 students and staff at two of the schools that we worked in, and 75% of them preferred lotteries to elections. If you want more information on that, we recently published an article that I can share with you at the end of the talk. It's in the Journal of Public Deliberation. So, Terry and Chris, we've seen that lotteries have been successfully used to fill public office in, in Athens. Citizens panels around the world have been used in our courts to fill juries. And now they're showing they can be used to form student government. This all begs the question, where else should we be using lotteries? What about nonprofits? So nonprofits are often rightfully criticized for being out of touch with the people that they aim to help. And when I was preparing this talk, I realized that our nonprofit wasn't walking the walk. Right? And so just this week, we've decided that we're going to use lotteries to form a beneficiaries board. So we don't have all the details worked out yet, but basically, students and teachers in these schools are going to be able to be randomly selected to help us shape and evaluate the design of these student governments. And we've gotten to know tons of students and teachers over these years, so we could just go and pick those that we think are the best and brightest, the way a lot of nonprofits engage community leaders and, and important stakeholders. But lotteries are going to help us overcome our own biases and blind spots. And I have no doubt that some of the most important perspectives and proposals are going to come from people that we would otherwise overlook or underestimate. What about school boards that we don't want to be used as launch pads for people's personal electoral ambitions? or worker cooperatives that have grown too big for consensus but want to maintain their deep democratic values? What about consumer co-ops and credit unions? What about labor unions? Uh, one of our colleagues, Simon Peck at the University of Victoria, has a great paper exploring different ways that lotteries could reinvent and rejuvenate unions. And at the other end of the, other end of the spectrum, what about for-profits that want to tap into the knowledge of their workforce or better engage their shareholders? What about social movements? At Occupy, uh, we used to have this chant, uh, this is what democracy looks like. You probably heard it at one point. And I found myself wondering if that was based in, in reality, right? I was there, I was intimately involved, and in what I saw looked more like dysfunction. Oftentimes, it was infused with some problematic power dynamics that went unnamed and under the radar. 
You see, as activists and organizers, we tend to be passionate about direct democracy, but we tend to be pretty passive about the challenges of scale. And the general assembly model that we saw it occupying in a lot of movements and, and protests, the involve everybody in every decision model, doesn't scale. With. And so I think we need to be actively searching for ways to maintain the essence of direct democracy as our movements grow. And I think that lotteries are a great place to start that search. And last, but definitely not least, what about government? There's been some really intriguing proposals uh, as to how to incorporate lotteries to improve government. And we can imagine, imagine a randomly selected citizens commission that headhunts, evaluates, and selects the most qualified public administrator to be a man, or the most qualified lawyer to, to be a judge or a district attorney. Or what would it be like if we used a civic lottery to form a state legislature? So no parties, no donors, no political theater, just a microcosm of the state's population deliberating together about the policies that will shape their state. Or what would it be like to have a Congress that actually reflects this country? that looks like America, lives like America, and leaves parties and polarization behind. I've been knocking on doors in different parts of this country and talking with people, and I'm finding that these are ideas that a lot of Americans can get behind. So whether it's randomly selected citizens panels, or randomly selected student governments, we're seeing a lot of progress on this front, a lot of potential, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think we need to be bold. I think we need to start rethinking our own institutions and organizations. And I think we need to start getting beyond the ballot. And if we do that, then I think we'll finally start to see what democracy looks like.